the first thing to say is that we have some of our colleagues from the venture capital unit who are here. They're just sitting down over there, Chris Hopkins and Richard Lewis. What we've been asked to do today and what we're going to do today is try and package some fundamental points that are around the subject of successful entrepreneurship. Now, successful entrepreneurship is unique to you and everybody individually, but there are some trends and there's some thoughts. And the way that we're going to do that is we're going to have five entrepreneurs who are in company build mode right now, who we've chosen to tell their stories. We have, with the exception of Eileen, some slightly older um, entrepreneurs who have been through that process a couple of times, who are going to just point out some, some interesting themes. And then we're going to get together as a panel and just sort of reiterate those sort of themes. My objective for you all is that you're able to take away some pointers that will work for you, because they're different for every type of company, everything that we're doing. Um, and so let's just get started with the process. Um, how many people are actually listening to this right up here? Hi there, how are you? Um, how many entrepreneurs do we have in the room? Fantastic. How many do you think we're going to have by the end of the session? <laughs> Fantastic. Well, I thought it was appropriate to start the first entrepreneurial um, presentation by a guy called Matt Clifford. Now, you might think his number one claim is he comes from Bradford, um, but his real interest with his co-founder, who I think is here, Alice, maybe not, um, is their company is called Entrepreneur First. It's unique around the world. They've been going 18 months. They're ex-McKinsey consultants who are revolutionizing the way that graduates become entrepreneurs. So I thought that was a great place to start. Matt. I think at some point, my slides are going to appear up here. Ah, look at that. Excellent. Well, it's really good to be here today. Uh, as Chris says, my name is Matt Clifford. And uh, with my co-founder, Alice, uh, I set up Entrepreneur First uh, about two years ago now. and. Uh, we, as, as, as Chris has kind of leaked all my starting lines, we were um, at the time management consultants uh, at McKinsey, for which I apologize, but it did lead us to our uh, kind of first question, our motivating question in trying to create Entrepreneur First was that McKinsey is a place that attracts a lot of ambitious people. And uh, unusually, after two years of working there, they kind of kick you out and say, go do something else and then come back if you still want to be a management consultant. And I would see lots of my colleagues leave and go and do various interesting things. Some of them would go to business school. Some of them would go work at clients. And actually, an increasing number in the time I was there would actually leave to start their own companies. And it, this is it's very intimate, actually. Um, and it, it got us to think, I'll probably just wait, actually. It got us to think, it's a really interesting question to ask. Why is it that in the UK and in Europe more generally and probably across the world, the brightest and most ambitious graduates want to start their careers in things like finance, in consulting, in uh, law, accountancy? What, what is it um, that makes them answer this question? What should the most ambitious young people do with their lives? Why is professional services the answer? Um, because the more we thought about it and the more we saw our colleagues leaving to start businesses, it became clear to us that if we could make the answer to this question, if we could make the answer to what should ambitious young people do with their lives be they should start their own businesses, then it was really possible to do something really exciting. And that's what Entrepreneur First is all about. Our mission is to make founding a startup the number one career choice for the most ambitious graduates. Um, as we start to think about this two years ago, we, we encountered a pretty big barrier pretty quickly, which was, yes, there are lots of really, really smart graduates in Europe. And yes, a lot of them have the skills that are needed to set up an early stage technology company. Our universities churn out great engineers, great computer scientists, and lots of great people with other skills that would be valuable on day one in a startup. 
And yes, there are lots of great accelerators in Europe, uh, lots of infrastructure, if you like, for startups to take people from being a couple of people and an idea in a garage to being a funded company. But what if you're not in that situation? What if you are just a really smart, bright, talented, driven individual, and you don't have your team yet, and you don't have your idea? And we went to talk to a bunch of these people to see what happened to them. And what we found was that they were really engaged in entrepreneurial activity while they were at university. But the minute they had to make a decision about what they would do after university, startups, and certainly founding a startup, didn't see an option. They didn't have a team, they didn't have an idea, and they didn't know where to start. Which seems like a pretty, pretty big barrier. If you're going to build companies, you'd have thought you would need teams and ideas. And, and of course you do. Um, but what we wanted to ask ourselves was, what sort of program would you have to build to get this quality of people to build startups if they don't already have a team and if they don't already have an idea? Um, and the answer, we hope, is, is Entrepreneur First. So Entrepreneur First is a year-long program uh, in which our promise to the, the people who joined us, to the graduates who joined us straight out of university, is that we'll spend a year with you helping you build the team, come up with the idea, and then accelerate that idea all the way to being a funded company. So we focus mainly on technical talent. We focus mainly on people who can code, who can build things. We spend six months with them part-time while they finish their degrees and over the summer, helping them build teams and come up with ideas. And the team building element is really crucial. We, we don't believe that this is something that's really easy to do by yourself. We think you do need a team, but we think that too, in too many universities, there are not enough people who want to be founders to make teams reliably emerge from universities. So what we do is we build a nationwide and increasingly a continent-wide pool of people, a cohort of people who are committing to build something together. Now, at the start of the summer, they don't know who from that cohort they're going to co-found with. But over the summer, we spend one day a week with them, watching them build together, try out different combinations of teams, try out building lots of different products, until by the end of the summer, they know who they want to work with, they know what they want to build, and they're ready to get started. And that's where our second six months come in. We then spend six months full time with them. They come into our offices every day. We provide free office space. We provide mentoring from some of the leading entrepreneurs in the country, training from this year. We now provide funding as well, uh, as well as access to funding through a network of investors. And when we, when we started this um, and we told people about it, they understandably thought it was a a pretty stupid idea. Um, you know, kind of one of the founding ideas of investing in early stage companies is that you at least invest in the team and a team that knows each other a bit. And can you actually build uh, teams that are worth investing in in a six month uh, program? Um, we think the answer is yes, and we think the results from the first year of the program demonstrate that. We took 30 individuals who, between them, teamed up to build 11 startups. Uh, 10 of those 11 have received uh, follow-on funding from, from angels and institutions. Between them, they're now worth about $32 million based on the valuation in the last round. Uh, two of them, after building the team through us, graduated and were accepted by Y Combinator, which is um, the most successful accelerator on the, on the West Coast. Two of them have raised million pound plus seed rounds, having not known each other before the start of the program. So the early signs are, are really strong that actually, if you start with the right talent and you systematically remove the barriers that get in the way of them founding their own company right at the beginning, you can actually take people pre-team, pre-idea, and at the end, build fundable, exciting businesses. So what's next? Where do we, where do we go from here? Well, we actually think we're standing at this uh, really extraordinary moment in, in, in history, if that's not too grand, where Maybe 10 years ago, 20 years ago, if you were a really bright, ambitious graduate, you essentially would value how well you had done by asking, what is the most prestigious company that I can join when I leave university? We want to be the people who, in Europe at least, move that to the question you ask yourself is, what is the biggest company I can build when I leave university? We want this to be the obvious choice for the best and brightest people leaving university. Um, talked a little bit about our successes. In a way, what's most exciting is our failures. Uh, 30 people joined the program last year. 75% are still founders in their own company. 
The ones who failed, none of them are unemployed, living on the streets, uh, eking out an existent busking. In fact, the experience of trying to start something straight out of university and failing makes them more valuable as they go into their first jobs. Now, Entrepreneur First is absolutely not a job placement program. People join us to succeed, and our business model is all about them succeeding. But we think that the risk associated with giving this a go for a year, and if it fails, well, hey, you just go get a job or start something new, means that in, in three to five years, we can actually get to the stage where this is the obvious choice and the best and brightest. We're seeing really exciting signs that's already becoming true. We have people this year joining the program who've turned down jobs at Google, at Goldman Sachs, at McKinsey to join us. We're now the second biggest recruiter of Cambridge Computer Science graduates who were this year. And we really see a sea change uh, in, in the way that graduates are thinking about their career options. So that's where we want to go next. If that sounds like it might be of interest to you, then fortuitously, we are just about to open applications for Entrepreneur First 2014. They'll open at the end of September. Uh, if you want to apply, you can just apply online, entrepreneurfirst.org.uk, or just drop me an email, matt at entrepreneurfirst.org.uk. Thanks so much for, for listening. It's great to be here. Great. Thank you, Matt. Um, this good-looking gentleman here is Russell Buckley, um, and he is a successful entrepreneur by any measure. Um, you may have heard of a company called AdMob. Uh, it was uh, acquired by Google, Google's third largest acquisition, and that's all I'm saying. Russell. Thanks. So I, I just want to pick up on a few things which uh, you were saying in the, in the um, presentation, Matt. Um, you place a lot of emphasis on teams, it seems. It, I mean, what's your view on a single founder as opposed to a team? Um, we think single founders are totally possible. In fact, I think the next speaker is a single founder who came through our program, so I mustn't contradict uh, our, uh, as myself too much. Um, I think Emily, who's, a, who's about to speak and is a single founder who came through Entrepreneur First, would agree that uh, while it's certainly possible, there are huge benefits to having someone else uh, in the room. I know from my own experience of start, starting Entrepreneur First that without Alice, it would be totally useless, uh, quite apart from the fact it means we can do twice as much work. It's the actual emotional burden of, of being a founder and knowing that everything relies on you as the founding team. I don't think I personally would be strong enough to do that by myself and carry that burden by myself. And I think that's probably true of a lot of people. Yeah. And um, I was intrigued when I came along to talk at your, um, one of your, to one of your cohorts. You actually spend quite a lot of time trying to persuade people not to be entrepreneurs and explaining how difficult it actually is. Can you talk, talk a bit about the downside of being an entrepreneur as well as the upside? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I think for us, um, we, we feel it's a huge responsibility to say to people at the start of their career, come and build a business, particularly because we absolutely do not believe that everyone should build a business. Um, we think it's incredibly hard. Um, we think it can be incredibly stressful. Uh, we are very open about the chances of success being slim. Um, and I think there is a danger that as, as startups become more popular in the UK and, and entrepreneurship becomes seen as a very sexy thing, that actually a lot of people stumble into it thinking it's the right thing for them and, and it's not. Um, I think the, the easy way to, uh, to think about it is to, is to just think about whether you can imagine doing this for five years and then it coming to nothing and how you would feel about that. And I think if, if you can't even imagine that the process is, you know, it's, it's certainly not a get rich quick scheme and that's something we emphasize a lot. And I think people have to be in it for the process and the, and the journey. We've got time for one more? Yeah. Okay. Um, so the, the other thing I'd like to kind of explore is, you know, you've had some successes and some failures, which is inevitable. Have you noticed a pattern in the sort of companies uh, who, uh, or the type of people who, who succeed and the type of people who fail, or is it just really down to the, the execution and the idea? Um, really the qualities of the type of people yeah, who succeed I'm um, looking for. Well, I think it, it's almost a, a cliche, but um, there's something about the relentlessness of the people who succeed. I, one of our companies is, uh, is called Kivo. They, they just went through Y Combinator and they're currently raising money out there at a very impressive valuation. Uh, it's very early days for them, but the early signs are good. And I remember they, uh, what they do is they build software for management consultants, um, which turns out to be a very lucrative market because management consultants have a, a lot of money. Um, and one of the uh, early challenges they had was they thought, well, this is easy. We're just going to walk in at McKinsey and BCG and Accenture and, and sell to the you know, CIO there, and uh, that's going to be great. Um, and we naively were like, well, yeah, come on, we'll help you do that. And we were fortunate we knew a ton of people at McKinsey, so we got them a call with the head of procurement, and we all dialed into this call, and um, 
Zephy, who's the founder there, was talking to this procurement guy, and it was just the most brutally negative conversation um, that I could imagine. You know, the guy was like, yeah, well, it doesn't sound very interesting. Even if it was interesting, it would take 18 months. And even then, we probably wouldn't pay you very much. It was really like, don't, don't come here. And I honestly came off the call thinking, right, well, they should start again. What are they going to do? Zephy was totally, totally uncowed uh, by this. It made zero difference to the way he thought about the company, to the way he thought, well, he obviously made him think about distribution in a slightly different way, but it in no way shook his confidence. And the next day, he was on the phone to another 100 management consultants to find another way in. And I think people who have that kind of relentlessness and just have no interest in the no, um, that's, I think, what it really takes to succeed. Yeah, well, one of my favorite stories is Colonel Sanders, who, uh, for his sins, invented Kentucky Fried Chicken when he was starting out trying to persuade people to take his chicken recipe, uh, got a no from 1,003 <laughs> people before he got a yes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we'd, you know, the flip side is we saw people fail where, honestly, I know that it was just that they didn't ask enough people. And I think that's the brutal truth is it's not glamorous. It's a massive schlep, really, and you just got to be willing to do it. Okay, Matt, we'll wind it up on that. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Thanks, guys. Thank you. So our next, there will be an opportunity to ask everybody questions. Um, I think it must have been um, about this time last year, I went to Entrepreneur First Cohort. I met, if I may say so, a young lady who said, I am going to make cyclists more safer in every single city in the world. And I'm going to do it on my own initially, and I'll build a team. This is Emily Brook. And not only has she done that, she has some, she probably can't announce it right now, some to die for seed investors. Emily. Hi there. Can you hear me? Is that, can, they, can they hear me? Yes. Um, I thought I'd tell you about Blaze, what we do first, and then how I got here to be doing it. Um, so Blaze, we're the uh, brand for urban cyclists. This should give you a taster. Oh, there's no noise, no sound. That's all very spooky, but um, we're doing, we're launching with a, the Blaze Laser Light. So this is a product for urban cyclists that tackles the biggest cause of cyclist fatality, which is being caught in the blind spot, or vehicles turning across an unseen bike. It's a front bike light, a beautiful white LED bike light, but it also has a laser, and it projects the symbol of a light, of a bike, just in front of you onto the road. It's a really simple idea, um, but it's a very big problem, um, and that's why there's been quite a bit of excitement around it. And we're launching with a laser light in uh, Evans, one of the biggest bike retailers here in the UK, on our own website, blaze.cc. Um, and we've got a range of other products. We've got three lights that will be launching later this year or early next. Um, but we want to be growing a brand for urban cyclists. There's plenty of problems for city cyclists, um, and we want to tackle them. So I thought I'd tell you a little bit of how, how we got here, uh, or how I got here. I um, started off reading physics at Oxford University. Um, and I left to go and do design, product design in Brighton. Uh, Blaze was my final year project. I started the year with a theme of urban cycling, looking at the challenges that city cyclists face, and safety is by far the biggest. Um, and then looking at the statistics, the side-sweeping incident is by far the biggest killer. 79% of bikes hit are going straight ahead, and a vehicle turns into you. So that was the problem I wanted to solve, and I set about my final year at university doing that. And then I came up with the idea of Blaze literally cycling around town and thinking, that bus ahead of me can't see me. If I was there, he could see me. I shall project myself there. Um, Uni sent me on a scholarship to America, an entrepreneurial program, which I think kind of tweaked the, kicked off the entrepreneurial thinking, um, and also sent out a press release. And within two days, it was on every cycling blog in the UK. It was on the Sydney Morning Herald by the end of the week. And I kind of thought, hang on, this is, this is something quite exciting, and I should do something about this. So then came Entrepreneur First. Um, I applied for them at the end of that summer. Um, I knew I wanted to be building this. I wanted to be doing my own thing. I would make the decision to 
do it the hard way, learn, set up manufacturing, grow a brand, grow a team, take some investment, all the things I knew absolutely nothing about. I decided I wanted to learn, um, and they're in a fantastic uh, golden ticket and accelerator that helped me do that. Their network has been completely invaluable, um, and it's been with it, I've, this has been a year. So this was boot camp this time last year with Entrepreneur First, and here I am with a small team with a product launching. Um, it, we're in mass production right now, um, and we're going to be in sales this, this autumn, which is crazy. I take a step back. Um, I put the project on Kickstarter back in November, uh, which is a fantastic platform, and I completely recommend anybody thinking about doing it. For a hardware company trying to get something to market, it's absolutely invaluable because it proves demand for something that hasn't been yet released. So um, I'd never, you know, it was me talking about this crazy idea, this crazy bike light, but actually putting it out there in front of people and having them back it um, was so valuable. So the way it works is a crowdfunding model. We wanted to raise 25,000 pounds in a month, and we did that in less than five days and went on to raise 55,000 pounds. And we have 782 backers who are our biggest fans and our biggest advocates and who are awesome. Um, they give us feedback on the product, which is completely invaluable. Uh, they stick their hands up and said they want USB charge done. We'll, we'll give that for you. We're building it as we speak. Um, so yeah, Kickstarter was a, was a fantastic first step to getting a product to market. Off the back of that came a bunch of, a bunch of press. Um, it's, a, again, a very big problem and a very simple idea. So people somehow love talking about it, which uh, is very awesome. Um, and there's been an awful lot. We went on the, the one show last year and all sorts of things have been happening, which has been good fun. But it's, um, that's also been really helpful. There's been a lot of interest coming in from, from that. And now I have a team of about four, four or five, depends on the day of the week, um, in East London. Um, we had the prototypes arrive from China yesterday, um, which was crazy exciting. Um, and yeah, so the tooling went off this week um, and will be in stores by, by, by Christmas. Um, and that's, that's Blaze, really. Um, Great. Come on down. Sit down. Now, <laughs> I've just had a tele telepathy message from, um, from one of my colleagues. Um, will there be any discount if, if you're you know, listening to this presentation? Um, when, when these come in the stores uh, for these people all here, well, I mean, quite possibly, maybe yeah, maybe uh, maybe I a mean, rear light to match your front light for um, a discount. But I, uh, would you say that you have always been an entrepreneur, or have you become an entrepreneur? I I guess I've, I've, it's hard to say. You don't know if you know if you're a four-year-old if you're an entrepreneur or not. But I've always known I've been a bit different, and I wanted to do my own thing. I'm completely unemployable. I, I've either been studying or I've been building my company. So um, I've always been pretty independent and set on my own, following my own path. So that's sort of a yes, do you think? Possibly, yeah. Yeah, I think so. And how do you know you're un unemployable? Um, because I have no will to be employed. Right. <laughs> okay, I get that. Um, I don't know how many, how many people here would consider building a hardware startup? Well, there you go. It's great. It's, it's, it has all the hallmarks of hardness. It does. It does. That's probably what attracts you, is it? Or um, I love physical things. I love something that you can touch and feel and get your head around and something's tangible. Um, but it is it's a strange, funny environment because there are, there are a few of us in London building stuff, um, but we don't talk to each other. There is a huge environment. There's two in the back there, one over there. There's, yeah, there's, there's three hands here. There's a and big community there, around yeah. tech in London, which is fantastic. Um, and I, I'm, I'm speaking to a few people at the moment, I'd love to kind of build a community around that for hardware because yes, it is hard and we've got all the problems that a tech startup has and more when it comes to the working capital of manufacturing, of the logistics, of the fulfillment, of you know, things going wrong in China, time and time again, all this stuff that we all have to figure out. Um, but it's, it's worth it, it's fun. When, when a prototype arrives from China, it's super exciting. Uh, and finally, um, you did this Kickstarter program and, and you did that versus raising money first because? I didn't do Kickstarter for the money. Um, money had already been offered. Um, I'd taken a very, very, very small amount. It did more, there's three reasons. Proving the demand for right. something that hadn't been done before. It's a pretty wacky idea, sticking a laser on your bike and going cycling around town. And I'm in a much stronger position if I can prove people will actually want this and actually pay for it before I go and speak to retailers and have these, these big conversations. So proving demand, one. The feedback, too. So they give us completely invaluable feedback. Basically, they're paying for my market research, which is awesome. 
um, and the exposure. So it's a global platform, it's huge. We were one of the first UK companies right. on the site. That's right. And while we're on there, and then all the press came off the back of it um, because we're, we're up on Kickstarter. And you can also, for me, the video, a Blaze is a, is, it's a wacky idea, but once you see it in video, and I urge you, if you haven't, go and check out the website. The full three minute video explains this far better than I can. But once you see the concept in, in practice, it makes sense. And having it up on, in a link online in a video was really, really, really valuable. I'm sure every single person in this audience wishes you the greatest of success. What's next? What's next? Uh, growing the product. So we've got a, a roadmap of about 15 products. Um, there's two, two different things I'm looking at at the moment. Um, for example, one of them is really exciting, which is we're calling Bike Tracker. Um, it's the whole concept of, I mean, after personal safety, I think bike security is the next biggest problem. And Bike Tracker is a basically a brain you put in the bike that does two things. Constantly asking, one, am I moving? And two, um, am I with my owner? So it pairs with your phone and Bluetooth 4, and it knows that if it's, you're moving and you're not with your owner, probably stolen, it alerts the phone and you can track the bike if it's stolen, which is really cool. Um, and yeah, a couple of other things. Guys, Emily Brooke, that's fantastic. Um, could I ask um, Damien and Eileen to come, please? So, you've probably all heard of an entrepreneur who started at university. Um, you may not have met someone who built a Chinese game uh, successfully in, um, at university. Was, it, was created a digital agency and then went on to crack the minor problem of making the world's company data digital and online. Ladies and gentlemen, Damien Kimbleman of Judel. <coughs> Hello. Hi. Um, well, I, I, I think um, that's very kind, but grossly exaggerated. Um, uh, thank you. Um, do we have the presentation? Uh, which presentation would that be? Should be on this one. This one, where does it start? Yep, this? right there. The eight. Yep. So, <coughs> uh, I wanted to talk to you guys uh, um, about a few things today. Um, first off, you know, how I started the company and um, uh, it's quite funny having Eileen here because she's seen it um, literally from day one um, and has, uh, before she became um, an, in, uh, an, uh, an investor, she actually um, was an advisor for uh, nearly a year. Um, and um, she gave up her, her equity in the business so that her company could invest in us. Um, which is pretty remarkable um, as investors go. Um, so I started up Doodle with, um, for a few reasons. One, I felt that there was a great need for transparency in business um, and that um, this lack of transparency in business was actually bad for business. But I also started it up because I had this itch that um, I wanted to make something really sexy that wasn't sexy. Um, and what could be less sexy than accounting, right? It is possibly the least sexy thing imaginable. Um, and, but I, I saw things like, you know, Farmville, uh, you know, and I saw if you can make farming intriguing, you can make accounting, or you can make looking into your competitors' financials somewhat in, in, exciting. Um, you know, it, 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 you have to just look back to, um, <clears throat> you know, the rock stars of, the, uh, uh, of, of our generation. You know, 400 years ago, they were, they were jesters. And I think you can make anything really, really quite um, compelling um, if you really put enough uh, uh, attention to it. Um, so, we're still having trouble. Spinning ball. Um, so, shall I just wing it? <laughs> um, so I, I, I um, I'll, I'll give a bit of background as to um, how I came up with the idea. For, do a lot of you know what Doodle is? Yes. 
raise your hands? Okay, so we, for those who don't, um, we aggregate data on private businesses and we try and make it as uh, simple as possible to digest um, that information. Um, we actually give that data away for free. Um, and I'm going to describe uh, our business model in, 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 a, in a little bit. But, um, you know, when I, when I started this up, still no. <laughs> um, when I started it, oh God. <laughs> when I started uh, Doodle, I had had a, a, a really bad experience in business. Um, I, um, I started an agency with um, a friend of a friend. And I said that I would come into, um, I, I would put as much money as he put into that business. And so I put in 60,000 pounds and he put in 60,000 pounds. But he got that 60,000 pounds from um, a, a, a loan from Barclays. And Barclays had given him this loan backed on his management accounts from his business. Uh, and it, uh, asset backed on, on his house. Six months into the business, I realized that there was something wrong. Um, I was in charge of the money um, and not a lot of money was coming in and the stuff that we had invoiced wasn't coming in. And I started to sort of ask questions and, and I found that, that you know, he was a bit of a crook. But besides that, um, I realized that, that Barclays had, had given him a loan based on his management accounts, which were completely false, um, as well as uh, his, uh, uh, his, um, his uh, um, backed on his, his house that was leveraged up to the hill. Um, and I thought to myself that I was really, you know, at first I was really uh, felt bad about myself because I had actually you know, been suckered into, you know, working with him, and I could have easily figured this out for myself. How could I not read my, you know, his accounts? Um, and then I realized, you know, well, I shouldn't feel that bad because Barclays can't either. Um, and that's really bad. Um, and I realized that there's a huge amount of data actually on businesses, especially private businesses, but it's completely inaccessible. Um, and it's siloed, um, and um, there's no one service that brings this all together. And there are massive changes in technology in terms of, you know, how to handle this data, how to make these massive computations, how to link it. Um, and what I also realized is that there's a massive commoditization of this data. Um, everything that consumes electricity at some point will be connected to the internet and will be a data provider. And so there's massive amounts of data out there, um, but it's not contextualized. And the value is really not in the data itself, but in the information and insight that's achieved from that data. We're still... I've got... Oh, okay. Should we do the Q&A? Because I don't... Sorry? Is Eileen from Passion Capital. There's only a couple of things you need to know about um, about Eileen. Is she's in the top one, top 20 uh, wired um, digital women. I think it's is, is that what it says? Something like that. Um, she is from America, but thank God she's over here. Uh, Passion Capital is um, a um, remarkable early stage uh, venture fund centered right in um, the digital world of East uh, London. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Um, so even though people haven't had a chance to see your slides and your discussion about Doodle and the journey, maybe some questions about um, what do you think, if you look back on the last two years, I think since we've been working together, what was the greatest challenge for you as an entrepreneur? The greatest challenge? Um, so I, I, th I think there are a lot of um, uh, challenges as an entrepreneur but they're made a hell of a lot easier um, with a great team. And I think if, if um, you know, there's all of this talk, I'm a single founder, by the way, and, and 
uh, I think two years ago, the tide was sort of uh, about to change where people were sort of saying, well, you know, maybe single founders are the way to, to, to go. Um, maybe, you know, non-technical, but more designer, more user experience founders are a new view of, of, of or what's, what's, what's hot. But I think that the most important skill that a founder could ever have is being good at hiring. Um, because every single founder, and HR is by far the most important uh, uh, position and the most important job that I have um, in the company. And, you know, um, you know, look at Sergey Brin and, and, and some of, you know, some of Zuck's, you know, code. It's not really that great. Um, it's funny, actually, if you, if you look at it. And um, I think, uh, I, I, I strongly believe that the most important um, uh, job is, is to be able to figure out, you know, who's really talented and bring them on. So how do you do that, especially if you're not technical and you're hiring technical people, or if you're not a marketing specialist and you're hiring marketing, how do you do that for functions that you don't have experience in? Um, <clears throat> I, try and, I try and understand them a lot more. Um, I, I had a, a business that failed, so I, I made a lot of those <laughs> mistakes um, uh, in terms of hiring, and I, I think uh, I've not had to make those mistakes now. Um, but um, it's, I think the biggest thing is um, realizing what you're good at and what you're not so good at and being all right with that. Um, yeah. One more question. What, what's one single piece of advice you wish you'd had two and a half, whatever it is, three years ago before you started Doodle? Um, start with a problem. <laughs> No, um, you know, I, I did start with a problem, but there were a lot of problems that I was thinking about that sort of came together. And I think um, uh, in some respects, um, if I'm going to be very critical, we pivoted, you know, um, uh, within two weeks of, of doing our, our, our first prototype, um, even though we had, we had won a, you know, a tech crunch um, uh, mini, you know, sort of um, uh, event. Um, I think it's really, really understanding um, that problem. The problem that we were solving was way too big, and it still is, but it's taken us two years to get to the point where people are starting to understand the power of Doodle. So figure out the problem you're trying to solve and then how you're Making going to small, get to that. Yeah, in small Figuring steps. out yeah. smaller problems okay. Okay. and how they relate to the bigger ones. Fantastic. And you go to the, your website, which is judil.com. Oh, they've given up? They've given up. Have they given up? Yeah. Or no? Well, should I? Should I, know yeah. the, I know the slides. So, um, I imagine you might. They're, they're really beautiful <laughs> slides. Um, uh, so what I wanted to talk to you about was um, uh, when we started off, we didn't have any marketing budget. Um, and, um, uh, you know, it, we felt a bit like David and Goliath. You know, there are these big credit rating agencies. There are big, you know, the, the Bureau of Van Dykes, the, the, the Dun & Bradstreets of, of the world. And then there was little old Dust. <clears throat> um, and one of the things that we did... Um, was we thought that there were there's so much data out there. Um, uh, what could we do um, to be really disruptive? So the first thing that we did was we gave the data away for free, right? We said all of this these um, these data providers have been selling and reselling and reselling. Let's give that data away for free because we were only paying something like you know uh, fifty thousand pounds at the time, right? Um, but um, the second thing, and sort of the, 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 the more exciting thing is, is that ActionAid came to us. Um, ActionAid uh, said, you know, um, you have all of this, uh, this data on private companies. Um, do you think that you could help us out, figure out, you know, all of the foreign subsidiaries um, of the FTSE 100 companies based in tax havens? And so with 250 quid, 
um, we um, compiled all of the data on um, uh, foreign subsidiaries and in, 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 based in tax havens. And with that 250 quid, that, that changed policy. That, you know, um, if you read about um, Starbucks or if you read about, you know, uh, any of these, these companies, uh, you start to, to, you know, it started with us. It started with us opening up that data. And anybody has a 250 pound budget for marketing with their startup. And um, you can really dig into stories. Nobody wanted to write about us before. They just weren't, you know, when we went to, to tech press or something, you know, they wouldn't write about us, but they'd write about stuff that we, we, they, we if we wrote the story, they would copy it, you know? And you start to, to open up the, um, this data and you realize that if you had 250 pounds and it, you were able to, you know, make such an impact, imagine if you really, you know, deal with these um, uh, problems uh, properly. And so the last year and a half has really been spent on uh, building infrastructure to handle massive, massive amounts of, uh, of data. Uh, and one of the first um, uh, features or services that we're releasing um, starts to democratize that ability to create narratives on these uh, companies and industries. So one of the things that we're releasing this week is called Advanced Search. It's not the greatest name, but um, uh, what it does is you can do things like, I want to find all of the companies outside of London with a debt to equity ratio of X that have exposure to the Chinese yuan, see all of their directors, and very soon see all of your mutual contacts. Or compare and contrast uh, you know, venture capital in Leeds versus London. Um, and, or aggregate all of the, the, the data on, um, on the restaurant industry within London or within broader UK. And you can do this within seconds. So you can actually um, make a lot of these, you know, a lot of these queries that, you know, brought up the, those, you know, um, stories about Starbucks. You can make that about the UK um, uh, economy. And anybody can do that. And I think that's really exciting because, you know, um, going back to, to, to the reason why I, I started Doodle, I started Doodle because I was really interested in the fundamental narrative behind these businesses. Um, but it was being told in boring numbers. And I wanted to bring that narrative, bring that sexiness out because anybody's intrigued by you know, these, these stories. And um, I, I, I might not be the best storyteller myself, but I try and make tools that tell a, a beautiful story about business. So we had a lot of cool slides, but that's, that's the sum, sum summary of, of what I was going to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. So Judil um, is available. Um, thank you very much, Eileen. Thank you very much. We, as one wonderful comedian once said a long time ago, now for something completely different. I was invited to um, an evening event. I was the least glamorous person there. I know that's not difficult for you to imagine. But I met a young entrepreneur that has the ability to revolutionize the way shops get popped up. Ladies and gentlemen, Ross Bailey. Keep talking, they'll do it. Yeah, okay, I'll just get this set up. Do your slides work, most importantly. I'm hoping so. Hopefully it will get it all up. Working. And then... Cool. Um, so my name is uh, Ross Bailey, and I'm the founder of Appear Here. 
And I'm going to talk about three quick things. One is a bit more about the business. Two, I guess, the journey of what you guys said, how we got here. And the third, I want to tell a story about this shop and how we made something happen in it. Um, so Appear Here. Appear Here is an online marketplace that connects people's vacant spaces to basically people with great ideas. And to us, someone with a good idea is a entrepreneur, a retailer, a big brand that wants to go out and make something happen. And we allow these guys to rent a space by the day, week, or month and do it flexibly online. So our aim is literally to make booking a space as easy as booking a hotel room and that flexible. And we do it online on hopefully a great product where you can go on, you can search, and you can discover spaces around the UK. And you can go through curated guides because to us, a shop's a bit boring. So it's all about the audience, the neighbors, people who are next door, and great content about the location. And you can go through these guides and discover spaces across the UK and hopefully soon um, across Europe and the US. So I guess the same way you can go online and you can discover rooms across the world to stay overnight, we want you to be able to discover spaces to launch your idea and make stuff happen. Um, so my journey, there's, there's not much to it, and I haven't got much of a background. So I'm 21, and I guess I've had a bit of an unconventional education, that I left school at 16 and um, went on to work, f well, go to a college that was set up by a guy called Peter Jones of Dragon's Den. So if any of you have watched it, he's the sort of big tall guy. And I say it was a college, but we lived in a hotel, um, 20 of us, and we got taught there every day by him and his team who had, uh, you know, none of them were teachers. They were just giving us their time and their experience. And I then went and worked for a few years and set up my own ideas and basically just tried to make things happen. And then I went to an advertising school in London called the School of Communication Arts. And every year they pick 20 students. And the guy who runs it is crazy. He wears multicolored trousers. He has hair out here. He travels to work every single day on a Segway. And he uh, invented like the video web banner and he's, he's, he's nuts. And he would send me to Tesco's, for example, at the weekend and say, you have got to sit in Tesco's for four hours. And while you're in Tesco's, you've got to watch what people do for two hours. And then you've got to follow people around, like a stalker, and guess what they're going to put into their basket. And he'd make people do crazy things like that and get you to really think about the customer and learn insights that you could then create a great campaign around. And I think that's something that I, I try and do and, and our team try and do all the time is to add those layers and think about not just the way people think, but the way they feel with whatever we do. Um, and by doing that, you know, there weren't teachers. It was always people there that had the experience that were teaching us. And it allowed us to put together, a, I guess, a great team of mentors. So when I was at Peter Jones's school, um, himself and other people around there were great support. And later, at the ad school, um, I met people who have gone on to become investors in Appear Here. And building those people around you that are really honest is amazing. And uh, there's one story that I think shows just how honest some of these mentors were, which was I was working for a guy in London, and um, he was probably as close to a gangster as you can get. <laughs> so I learned probably a lot more about what's not to do in business than what always to do. But he was a really interesting guy. And one day he said, okay, we're opening up a new concept in London and we want it to be in GQ magazine. And the PR company had failed to get them in GQ magazine. And he said, okay, Ross, you've got to go home tonight. Get us in GQ magazine. If you don't, I don't want you to come back tomorrow. You're fired. Um, so I was about, yeah, 16 at the time. And it's pretty tough to hear. Went home, I think I phoned people, probably cried down the phone, like begging them to get us into GQ magazine. Managed to get them in, ran into work in the morning, put it up on his sort of desktop computer, and it carried on with the day. And for the whole day, he didn't even say, well done or thank you. And at the end of the day, around six o'clock, he comes over to me, and he's like, why are you sulking? I'm like, I'm not sulking. He goes, yes, you are. And he like, got me to stand up. And as I said, he was a pretty scary guy. So when he said stand up, I stood up. And he said, put your hand on your back. And he sort of had this sort of voice, put your hand on your back. And I did it. And rub it from left to right. And I started doing it. And he goes, now if you're here to get a pack on the back, F off, basically. 
And if you're here because you want to be an entrepreneur and you want to build a team and you want to lead, then you shouldn't be doing things to get that pat on the back. And you should be doing it and you should be happy enough that you got us into GQ. And if you want to be here and you want to be my assistant, then expect a pat on the back. But if you want to be one day sat in this chair, then don't expect that. And actually, having that sort of adv advice from someone and, and that honesty has, um, you know, you always remember and it stays with you. And the last thing is like hustling and making things happen. So I was the kid at school that was dealing Coke um, in cans, very legitimately, um, going to Costco on a Friday, buying it in bulk and selling it for 50p extra. And it's always, to me, been about just trying to make things happen, not sitting still. And when we go back to appear here, that's what we tried to do with this store. Before we started, we wanted to test it out and see what it was like to be the customer. So learning what we learned from the schools in terms of the insights, how people feel. Um, we went out and we literally convinced this landlord to give us a shop for free. We called up brands, we were calling up BMW, Mini, everyone, convincing them to give us some money. We got together about 2,000 pounds, and in 10 days, we launched a shop, we created a brand. I think I was on clip art and Word trying to design T-shirts. And we sold this brand in time for the Jubilee. Um, so I'm going to show you a quick video of that and um, tell you a bit more about how that's related to appear here and what we're doing now. Yeah, so we, we literally got this shop 10 days before the Jubilee, had no fit out. So we had to sort of turn up at interior shops and load a van up with So the brand was called Rock and Roll, and we'd put together these t-shirts. Sony Music had given us some artists to put music in there. And I think what we showed is that we could took, take this empty shop, this sort of awkward pause in a landlord's portfolio. We could fill it with an idea. And a couple of guys, so me and a mate did this, who spotted an opportunity, spotted a moment we wanted to create something and be a part of, could rent a shop and make it flexible. And today, that's what we're trying to do at Appear here. We are making ideas happen. And right now, we've got over 350 years worth of ideas waiting to go into spaces. We've got 150 spaces nationwide and some amazing locations. And it's not just the little guys wanting to make stuff happen. It's big brands as well that have got accounts. So to us, the big vision, the big goal is to create a global marketplace where people can literally make their ideas travel and appear in London one week, Barcelona the next, and New York after that. And to us, retail's changing. The transaction point's moving online. Retail's becoming a media space. And to us, the moment we, we will be happy is when we can go onto a street in any city, in any location, and see stuff happening because we made it possible at Appear Here. Thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, this good-looking man here is actually our host, um, uh, director of Wera from O2, and had a distinguished career in um, O2. And I think the reason that everybody knows about baked beans is because actually this was the brand manager uh, for Heinz at one stage. And with that, over to you. Thank you very much. Ross, absolutely amazing. So um, earlier this afternoon, I was asked on stage, what is it that Wira looks for in an entrepreneur? And I said, uh, talent. In a word, um, yeah, talent. So D 
define that. And for me, it was a demonstrable track record of proven achievement. And I think you've got it by the lorry load. You are the absolute personification of what I was trying to describe. Thank you. Truly inspiring, delivered beautifully, an inspiring um, story, an inspiring presentation, an inspiring business. What I'm keen to find out is what's your inspiration? Where did the idea for this come from? Where the I um, so I'll start off with, I guess, where the idea came from. I guess, to me, I think whenever you sort of hear um, people who founded a business speak, it's always like there was that light bulb moment. And I don't think that that really exists. I think that probably people have an idea, and the light bulb moment moments are when they decide to really commit. And with a peer here, there was a few light bulb moments. And so one of them was, um, I remember there's a, 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 there was a town outside of London, and it had around 258 shops and 58 of them were vacant. And one guy had a shop sign on the front that said, rent this store from 200 pounds a week. And he was the only store with people in there. And you were starting to think, if, if we can make this model more flexible like he's doing, would the other stores be vacant? And surely there's a better way of doing it than this guy having some sign at the front of his store. And the second thing was when we did this rock and roll store, the same amount of people that were coming in to buy products were coming in to ask us just how we'd made it happen. And we're starting to think we've actually got something here. And I'd say the real moment where it was like, OK, we're going to commit to this and I'm going to make it happen was when we had um, a, a big US brand call up my mobile number. And it was the chief marketing officer of one of the biggest sportswear brands in the US. And she said, we want a store. We want it short term. And we were given your number. And first of all, I'm like, how the hell did you get my number? First of all, I'm like, you're a company doing billions and you're calling some kid in the middle of London. There's got to be some pent-up demand here. Um, and that's when we decided to fully go for it. Okay, so, so it's also uh, just a really delightful brand that you've created. And, and I'm quite keen to find out, you know, how did that come out? How did you find the name? How did you, did you brainstorm it? Was it did something that came to you? Did you have to hunt for it? Was it this sort of search through millions of URLs? I mean, how did you get the name? Um, so I actually remember Frank, who I've only just seen. I haven't seen in quite a while. but. Frank was actually a mentor at the advertising school. Frank's an amazing VC. And I remember sitting down with him at one point and showing him names and all different people that, were, that would come and I'd meet. And I've got a picture at home of a desk in the kitchen. And literally, my entire kitchen, every single sideboard was filled with pieces of paper. I'd say each piece of paper probably had 50 names on it. Um, and I wanted a word that got you excited but didn't really have any bad connotation. So to me, appear here and appearing, and the, the word appear has an excitement to it. And we wanted to get that through in everything we were doing. So it, we wanted it always to be about ideas, about making things happen, because property's boring, right? You know, a shop's boring, no one gets excited about that. And we thought, how do we make it sexy? How do we make it interesting? So the brand's always been probably the most important thing. Um, and whether it's designing the site or doing this stuff, we put a lot of care into it. Okay. So my third and final question is, you've taken a very unconventional path. Uh, Campus Party is all about exploring the new digital economy and what it means for people and the role that they can play in it. A lot of the thousands of people here are quite young people who are embarking on this journey, this entrepreneurial journey. Um, probably making big decisions about whether or not they do or don't pursue their dream, their ambition or not, whether or not they should continue with university or not. You know, all these kind of choices to do with a academia versus just going out there and doing it. Yeah. Uh, you've taken an unconventional path. What advice would you give to the young people here who are making those decisions themselves? So, to me, I've, I guess I've always kept it really simple, which is I remember when I was at school and I'd have there was like a Wednesday where the first two lessons were like double maths. And then after lunch, we had like double science. And I remember every Tuesday night before I went to bed, you'd have that sort of sick feeling where I'd be thinking, I do not want to go into school tomorrow because I just, these lessons are going to be boring. So my whole thing is if I ever wake up and I've got that sick feeling or I ever have that the night before, I don't want to be doing what I'm doing. So if someone's at university and they're enjoying it, great. If someone's at you know, doing whatever they're doing and they're not enjoying it, then life's far too short, right? So I never want to have the sick feeling. I want to be doing something all the time that I believe in. And I think that whether you're 
16, 20, 30, 40, whatever age you are, if you keep your head up, sorry, <laughs> 50, 60, 70, whatever age, if you really believe in something and you're really passionate, I think it's infectious. And I think it's infectious with investors. I think it's infectious with a team. And I think your team's excitement is infectious with customers. So if you're happy and you enjoy it, then go for it. That is absolutely brilliant. Big round is fantastic. Thank it's a pleasure meeting you, man. Thank you. So we're going to do one more, and then we're going to go have a panel session and get some of your questions. Christopher, are you ready? And Hussein Kanji. Now, ladies and gentlemen, a special round of applause for Hussein Kanji, because the last time I saw him was on the BBC 10 o'clock news talking about the Nokia, um, um, motor, Nokia Microsoft acquisition. Christopher, yeah, that's cool, isn't it? That's cool, I mean, uh, our very own Hussein Kanji on the BBC. Um, Christopher, serial entrepreneur, businesses in New York and in the US, and you're doing the last one, and we're looking forward to your story. Okay, uh, can everybody hear me okay? All right, cool, so the, um, I was told the agenda for today's event was uh, to try and inspire people who are considering an entrepreneurial path to, to do that, and I was very honored to hear that my story might help you nudge you, nudge you in that direction. Um, for, for me, I don't have any slides, it's all, it's all me, so that's, you're gonna have to, deal with that. Uh, the, the story for us started um, in college, in university. I was studying uh, biomechanics with my, with my co-founder, and we, we hated the school. Like, we, we genuinely, the, the failure of education and, and why it sucks, it seems to be a recurring theme amongst many of the speakers here. That was definitely the case for us as well. It was tragic. Oh, okay. It was, uh, I thought that was me. It was uh, tragically boring, and we hated the way the system worked, how it was very, very achievement-oriented, and the idea that you can be 19 and 18 and even have the concept of, of achievement as something that guides you seemed, seemed perverse. So we said, how do we build our own school? Did the math and calculated we need about 80 million euros to, to do that, to build our own university. So we said, what is the easiest way to make 80 million euros? And the easiest way would be to, to build a tech company and sell it. And because we were much smarter than everybody else, we thought that wouldn't be very d difficult. So we said, fine. Um, the best way to, to build a tech company is to look at the most exciting industry in the world and the most exciting market, which was and arguably still is uh, mobile in China. So we raised a couple hundred thousand dollars and built a location-based uh, mobile social network in China uh, called Erbian, which is uh, very similar to what Foursquare is now. In fact, we thought we invented the check-in. Uh, the, the founder and CEO of, of, uh, of Foursquare and, and I were discussing that and we actually realized we were both not the first, first people to, uh, to do that. It's actually the Koreans. Um, so yeah, we, tried, we did that in China and uh, failed miserably. We had, a, we had to, we burned through all our cash. We had to let go of the entire team, which if you're like 22, 23 years old, is very, very difficult, sobering experience to do is to fire people. It's much, much harder to fire and say no than it is to hire and say yes. Um, and we ran out of money and we were completely broke. So to be broke in China, you have to be like a special kind of broke. And we really couldn't, couldn't afford to almost not to eat. So we built apps to survive. It was a pure survival mechanism. And we built uh, some of the largest, uh, one of the largest photo apps until Instagram. Actually, when Instagram came into the market, we were like, oh, these guys are a bunch of bullshit. And this, we'll, uh, we'll crush them. And uh, the fact they've now sold for almost a billion dollars chafes in a way that it's difficult to explain. But um, we, uh, so we had 10 million users on, on one of our photo applications. We built another application, which is still one of the biggest brain training applications on the market, 10 million users as well. And we were raking in the cash, at least compared, not, not really, but compared to what we were before, which was genuinely hardcore broke, founder sleeping in the same bed kind of grisly crap. It was really awful. And, um, but, and we're making this money and realized that, that w the way we're making this money is, is, is with, with advertising. And advertising, as, as, all, as you all know on your smartphone, is still a horrible experience. And what we observed was, was that it's a, advertising is basically uh, a private network connecting billions of people together that's only used for one thing. It's like an entire road network that's only used for rickshaws. And we said, okay, what else can we use that network for? What else can we communicate apart from, uh, apart from an ad? And we tried building a question, and that's what Curiously is. We buy ad inventory and serve a question instead of an ad. And people, if they want to, can answer. And in doing so, they're effectively paying for the free content for the application or whatever with their voice. So it's, it's your opinion qua currency. That was the idea. We tested it out and the response rate was insane. It was like a, 
10 times higher than it was with ads, it still is. And we thought, okay, we, we, this, is, this is something that's got in, incredible potential. So we, uh, we tried, we said, let's, let's try and raise some money. We went to every single VC that we knew on the continent, in continental Europe, that is. Everybody said no. Across the pond, almost everybody said yes. So, so for us, that's a very symbolic divide about appetites, appetites towards risk. I just, just discussing that with Eileen earlier. And uh, we raised a $1.6 million seed round with Excel. Um, and since then, it's been a new kind of madness. We've uh, been scaling up the team. Our network now is around half a, half a billion people we can ask questions to. And uh, just closed an, another three and a half million dollar Series A with Spark Capital, who did uh, Twitter and Tumblr and that kind of thing, and are scaling operations as fast as we can in both the UK and the US. And that's pretty much what I'm doing now. Fantastic. Now, I should pr now properly introduce Hussein, who is a partner of one of our very new, exciting venture capital firms, Hoxton Ventures, um, and is synonymous with the Hoxton Hotel, in terms of the name at least. Um, welcome, Hussein. Thanks, Chris. So you started off by talking about what inspired you, which was, which was building a university. That's a great long-term vision. How do you get through day by day of building a company? That's a really, really good question. Um, I think you have to, I guess, d displace yourself from, this, from the angst yeah? and, say, and realize that this is all for something greater in the future and make yourself make, uh, want to be your future self in that future state where everything is working and not chaotic. Uh, become real. And then if you look across the industry, what inspires you or who inspires you? Who do you look to as kind of your role models or your mentors? I, I think, we're, again, I was discussing this with Eileen before this, uh, e Elon Musk, I think, is, is uh, probably number one. One for the complete outlandishness and absurd scale of his ideas and how, how well he understands risk and how it's actually not a risk. So that's a I think a key thing if you're thinking about becoming a, a, a founder is that the downside is much lower th than you think it is and then that what the tech trade press would have you believe. It's actually almost non-existent. You learn skills at an incredibly fast rate, you meet incredibly influential people, and you increase your earning power. So even if you, even if you fail, you are better off than when you started. It's not, it's not like a lost bet. So Elon Musk, someone who embodies that par excellence. And if you were to go back in history and go back to kind of your 20-year-old self, what advice would you give him? Uh, it sounds like you've collected a lot of lessons along the <laughs> way. I would have not gone to school and gone straight into doing stuff and building stuff. Um, but Did then I would not have realized, uh, yeah, that, that's actually a good question. I wouldn't have uh, developed my goal if I didn't go to it. So, but at the same time, I would have maybe saved some time. I, yeah. Did you did you drop out of school or did you did you complete partially or you completed all the way or I completed the bachelor's degree and I dropped out of my master's program. Okay. And what about post school? What, what would you what would you tell yourself kind of after you'd finished your that cliff? Because it sounds like you were in business, building a whole bunch of stuff, building apps, building you know building building a bunch of different things. What would you tell yourself? What could you have done differently if the path was different? If the path was up to you? Yep. Passion and gen gen genuine interest in something is always the most important. It's a, the same thesis that we had with the school that we wanted to build, was that it shouldn't be about achievement. It shouldn't be about an ends to a means. It's, everything is an ends to a means nowadays, yeah? And everything is an ends to an ends to an ends to an ends to an it, it, it makes no sense. And uh, to try and do as much, um, where the, the actual doing it is the reason why you're doing it. One, one more question, I guess. What are uh, one or two non-obvious lessons that you've learned that maybe people in the audience wouldn't know about building a company or about raising money or about building a product? Something that is unintuitive that you don't normally see on the blogs or the, or the hacker news, et cetera. Non-intuitive. Um, it's much easier to build a company when you don't make any money. So when you, you, when you raise on past performance, if you... If you're generating revenue, you have to, you're accountable to your past performance. Whereas if you're trying to build a company on a, on a vision, the vision is normally quite huge, infinite. So even if you uh, adjust infinite for risk, you still have a huge valuation. That would be, I think, a right. So sell the vision? Sell the vision, yeah. And even if then if you fail, you've still won because you've, you're doing something that you believe is better. And Arsenal or Chelsea? Arsenal all the way. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic, guys. If you'd stay there, Hussein, if, if Russell and um, Eileen and um, my microphone could come with me, just uh, come up here. Um, and Simon. Here you're um, 
Any questions that are burning anyone's mind right now? I, I'm not quite sure how we're going to do the microphones, but any can, if you could just whisper in my ear and I'll tell everybody what it is. Well, it's quite, um, oh, sorry. Maybe you just, do, you just do that, yeah. Okay. My question is this. Uh, you're a venture capitalist, and I'm actually an investment banker, but, well, rather a technologist. And we both understand finance, and you hear on the stage, you hear everybody talking about abstract nouns like drive and, and ambition, but I want to talk about numbers. So if your target rate of return is 20%, and you have a basket of ventures, say five in your basket, and four of them are going to fail, that sole remaining venture has to make 100%. So my question is, so that's the terms you have to offer. My question is, who would borrow at 100%? And I'm totally struggling with this. Who would like to pick that one up? I, so that's, that's, that's a your one, Hussein. So, so the, 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 the quite, I, I can, you can hear me, right? The question really is, is how does a financier think about venture when, when actually the failure rate is so high? I mean, that's the fundamental question here. From, from a fund perspective or from a deal perspective? From a return on equity perspective. A return on equity on a fund or return on equity on that one individual investment? The fund. On the fund. Yeah, I mean, so the economics of a fund are very simple, right? You have to, each one of your deals has to have the potential to be able to return a significant portion of the fund back, if not the entire fund back. Because if you do have a failure rate, I mean, it's very easy to mathematically model this, right? If you have the capital to invest in 20 investments, which is roughly uh, the, the number of investments that you need in a portfolio to be able to cross a certain kind of hurdle, which is usually about 3x for early stage funds. Um, and the math for that's really easy. It's just a, it's just a, it's a, it's an, it's, it's just a, it's a probability. It's if you think your chance of success is five percent or ten percent, it's one point oh five to the nth power. Solve for n. You want to get an eighty percent confidence interval. You solve backwards. You get twenty something investments. And historically, that's always what's been the case. And then the question is, among those twenty investments. How do you make sure that they can deliver enough of a return to be able to cover the losses? And it depends on how many, how, what your portfolio composition looks like. If your portfolio is mostly going to succeed, but you don't need, you, you won't get that many huge winners, then you don't need a huge winner to be able to override those other companies. If your portfolio is going to be mostly losses because you're taking very early risky stage bets, then your one winner has to be massive. A and then you look for things, and this is where it's as much of an art as it is a science um, to be able to find the things that turn out to be the, you know, the very large companies that can drive returns. And you find most early stage funds perform on the basis of having one or two investments that are the Instagrams or the Facebooks or the Twitter et cetera, that generate a significant portion of the value of the fund. Great. Could I have a question from an entrepreneur? Anyone have any questions? Anybody have any questions? Yeah. I think, yeah. And then we'll get a summary from the, the panel, because I appreciate we've been going quite a long time. Thank you. Uh, my name is Martin Zierati. I'm from a company called C4FF. Um, a lot of people will have lots of ideas and they'll come up with them in the shower and whatever. The question is they don't know whether they're any good or not. There Are there any sort of platforms that you would recommend where they can sort of get people to evaluate them like a Facebook, you know, to give likes and comments? Um, we're doing such a similar thing for companies um, and it's called Extreme Factories. So that's uh, my question to the panel. You get that? Well, I'll have a go at that first. I mean, I think the way we normally talk, think about early stage uh, ideas at the moment is to try and come up with a minimal viable product, which is the way we think about um, early stage stuff at the moment. So the minimal viable product is, is, as it sounds, that what can you do to, at the very minimum, to test the idea? So if you've got a, a great idea like um, a social networking site for dogs, as an example, is that a good idea? Well, the easiest way to find that out would be to spend maybe $50 on a Google search campaign advertising the product, even if it didn't exist, because you can tell by the number of people who click on it if there's demand for it, or how many dogs in this case click on it, uh, which might be the answer to the question anyway. <laughs> Guys? Okay, I think, I, I think we've... Um, had a great session here. So what I'd like to do, if it's okay with everybody here, is just start with um, Simon and just get a summation of 
sort of kind of what we've heard. I mean, what I've heard is, oh, on stage, makes a difference. What I've heard is that, um, is that entrepreneurship is great, but you know, you have, there's things to do and there's things to learn, etc. cetera. Um, and we've had a lot of those things and we've had some great entrepreneurs today. So, Simon. So with regards to those great entrepreneurs, I think it's always a privilege to listen to entrepreneurs talk about their story and about their business. I think that's always an amazing thing. Um, I think it's truly inspiring and I think one of the things that is a theme for the whole of Campus Party and why we're being here and this amazing panel of people uh, is to help foster that inspiration and give people the confidence uh, to uh, take the unimaginable step of actually embarking on creating your business. I think another aspect of it that is fundamentally important to the potential success of people who take that uh, bold step is networking and connectivity and the people that you meet. And it's not just about serendipity, you've got to actually actively go out and pursue it, recognize what your strengths and weaknesses are, and find people who are gonna, you know, if you're, if you're wanting to create the Rolling Stones and you're the Mick Jagger, then who is your Keith Richards? And I think that this kind of environment is a brilliant place to go and find the other band members. And so I would say, make the most of it whilst you're here. The only thing I would say is, and, and I think the entrepreneurs we heard from kind of speak to this, huge generalization and there are always exceptions, but I think your chances of success are increased if it's a problem you're trying to solve or a reason that you are genuinely, genuinely motivated by that not only do you think about in the shower, as you say, you get hundreds of ideas in the shower every day, but one that you cannot shake, you, it stays with you the next day, the day after that, the day after that, the day after that, because it's not easy. It's very hard to get through the day to day sometimes, very hard to get all the no's from the early sort of, you know, rejections of investment, team members, whatever it is. So it has to be something you are genuinely motivated by. It can be for different reasons to, you know, Chris was to make enough money to pay for his school, but something that really drives you and is going to take you through all the sort of hills and the troughs alike. The good news about what's going on in, in our economy right now, at least in the tech economy, is the barriers for entry have become so much lower. So it's so much easier for people to start a company, to validate whether the idea is a good idea or a bad idea, and to go get the early initial bit of traction. Now, these things are long journeys to build very good companies, but it's also significantly easier than it used to be in the, in the old days, back, back when, you know, 10, 15 years ago when the internet was still very young. Um, so, you know, your passion, your hard work, et cetera, can actually carry you quite a bit of the way there, I think, today than, than historically. Uh, and Russell, just to, to, to add one thing to whatever you're going to say, OK to fail? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I think one of the problems we, which we're often um, accused of is, is uh, over in the UK is that um, we put too high price on failure, whereas in the US they tend to just get up, fail, and get up again sort of thing. Um, I think, um, you know, the whole point about an being an entrepreneur is that, um, first of all, if you ever end up failing altogether, well, that's not actually a failure. And I think Ross was talking about that earlier on. Um, it, it's, it's just a learning process. But on the other hand, uh, it's also very rare to start a company uh, which just knows exactly what it's going to do, executes and sells out for a billion dollars uh, a few years later. You know, that what you actually see when there's overnight successes of a, a lot of hard work, a lot of thinking by the product people and the, 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 the CEOs, um, and the ability to pivot and find out what the answer is to the, uh, to the problem you're trying to solve. Um, it's not just a, an overnight process, it's, it's a lot of hard work. So I think you have to, um, embrace failure and, and work out um, where, where your company is going and, and the best way to get there. But it's not something to be um, afraid of. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much for the entrepreneurs. And I leave you with this final point. I'm not quite sure where North is. But at the northern point of this peninsula, you might argue that a 16th century entrepreneur was a pilot, pirate. You might argue that. I'm not making any assumption about entrepreneurs today being pirates for one minute. But at that north point of this peninsula, they were left hanging as an example uh, of um, not actually to be a pirate. Um, the point is, is be an entrepreneur. You don't get hung for it. You're always learning something. You're always creating something. And that iteration will ultimately create success. As Russell so beautifully said, 
you never heard about Facebook 1.0, 1.2, 1.3, 1.4. All you hear is about Facebook and how wonderful it was. How many iterations were there? Thank you so much, guys. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you.